you doing this morning? Good? Good? Yeah, okay, well, I, I, let's try that again. How are you doing this morning? That was better. That was a little better. At least for some of us are awake. Um, for those of you who have no idea who I am, my name is Chad Lowe. I'm the interim campus pastor here at Tri-Village Church, and I am so, so thankful that you are here worshiping with us this morning. Um, I would love to, to get to know you and to greet you personally, so after the service, I'll be standing by the steps. I'd love to shake your hand and just say hello and welcome you for being here. We're so glad that you are here. And as Chris McElway mentioned, I invite you, church, to continue to be praying for the search of this campus pastor. Um, I, I've been saying it since the day that we knew we were searching for one, and I'm going to keep saying it over and over and over again. TBC, let us be a praying church. Let us continue to be praying for this campus pastor, for this church, and for what God is doing both in and through us, because we are not done. Amen? Amen. So I'm excited. We are, we are starting a brand new series called True Identity. Um, and this series, we're going to be going section by section through the book of Ephesians. Now, we just finished a series uh, called Spiritual Warfare, where we've been looking at Ephesians chapter 6. So kind of like if you've been here and you've heard Pastor Hannibal say this before, it's, it's like when you watch the end of the movie before you finish, you go to the beginning. That's what Hannibal does. He's a monster. But, um, <laughs> but we're actually going to be doing that. We're going to be playing by Hannibal's rule book, and we're going to be going. We, we already studied the very end of this letter, and now we're going to be going through and looking at the whole rest of it. And, and I believe it actually lays a, a perfect foundation for us because we know that we are at war, that we are living in spiritual warfare. And so now we need to be reminded by who we are. We need to know who we are so that we can know how to fight. And so as we've been going through the, as we're going to be going through this series in Ephesians, we're going to be looking at um, what we believe, what we believe about ourselves, our lives, and what truly defines us. And the reason that we're going through this letter, that we're going through what Paul wrote, is because he's actually writing this for a church, actually the whole region, not just the Ephesian church, but the whole region of Asia Minor, to teach, remind, and reinforce that what life in Christ looks like, that in Jesus we have an unshakable identity. An identity that's been given to us by grace alone and becomes a reality by faith alone. Identity that, it, that defines not just how we see ourselves, but how we see the world and how we see our lives. So we are going to be in Ephesians chapter 1. Would you please open your Bibles, turn on your Bibles, grab your Bible, open to Ephesians chapter 1, and would you please stand for the reading of God's word. We'll be in Ephesians 1 verses 3 through 14. And we stand out of reverence and respect for the word of God. If you don't have a Bible, it will be on the screen behind me. If you're with me, say amen. Amen. Starting in verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the time reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ." In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession." to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are worthy. We thank you that we have your word, that we get to study this, that we get to gather as your church. And Lord, as we study the blessings of what it means to be in you, as we get to read the richness and the depth of of the, the beauty of the blessing that Paul wrote to encourage this church, Lord, let us be encouraged. Lord, let let this not just uh, sit in our minds, but Lord, let it transform our hearts and let us live changed lives because of the truths that we study today. Lord, I pray over your church. I pray that we would be free from temptation, from distraction, from anything that would be attacking us from fully engaging what you have for us in your word. And Lord, I pray that you would guard my mouth as well, that the words I speak, what is from me, 
Lord, dismiss it and let us forget it. But Lord, what is from you and what is truth in your word, let us not be able to forget it. Lord, we want you to be glorified. We want you to be praised. We want you to be lifted high. Lord, we pray this, that the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart will be pleasing to you, my rock and my redeemer. Pray this in your name. Amen. So there's some important questions that I think we, we all ask at some point in our lives, like, who am I? Why do I exist? Is there a purpose for my life? And these are questions that we all have, and they're questions related to our identity. We're all seeking to be something or to become someone. We all want to feel and know that our lives matter. We are all men and women who are searching for happiness and meaning. And we all have something inside us that says there's got to be more to life than this. The problem has been since sin entered into the world that there is nothing that is enough. There is nothing that truly satisfies. We search for happiness and meaning in the people that will never fully satisfy. We search for happiness and meaning in things that are gone in a moment. And we try to find our identity in something that was created instead of the creator himself bringing catastrophic consequences into our lives and to the lives of those around us. You see, both Christians and non-Christians struggle with this. We are all searching for identity. And Christians suffer with what Paul David Tripp writes um, throughout a number of his books called Gospel Identity Amnesia. It's kind of a mouthful. But Gospel Identity Amnesia. And non-believers are, are, are also struggling with identity and looking for it in the wrong places. But Paul Tripp writes about Gospel Identity Amnesia in this. He says, We know that identity influences our thinking, our choices, and our behavior. But we have a hard time getting identity right. He calls it identity amnesia, misunderstanding and replacing our identity in Christ. Identity amnesia is powerfully and potentially destructive. And here's the critical issue. Either you will define yourself vertically by who you are in the Lord, or you'll end up defining yourself horizontally by what the world says about you. See, Paul begins his letter to the Ephesians, reminding them and us of the blessings that we have in Christ. And so if you are a believer, then these blessings are yours. And if you are not a believer, if you're sitting here and you're, you, you're like, I don't know if I buy into this, these, this is what it is to be a Christ follower. Paul is reminding us and showing us of the, the wonderful depth of his glorious grace. And it's for you as well. So we're going to unpack this. We're going to unpack these truths, these truths about our identity by looking at first the promises of the blessing and then the person of the blessing. So let's begin by first looking at the promises of the blessing. In Ephesians 1, 3, it starts with this. Praise be to God, our God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. So we see right out the gate, at the very beginning, the triune, our triune God is at work. Father, Son, and Spirit, to bless us with every spiritual blessing. See, there is so much in these 12 verses. There's so much depth and richness and theological truth. The, the, the funny thing is, is that when this was written in the original, Paul had this as one continuous sentence. This would be every English teacher's nightmare. Um, all of this, all these 12 verses was one singular sentence, one train of thought, one continuous movement. And so today is both going to be somewhat of a sermon and kind of a systematic theology class, okay? Don't let that scare you. Don't, don't be like, oh man, what did I get myself into? This is going to be awesome, and we are going to go through this together and really dive into the depth of the richness of what Paul is saying here. Sound good? I'm not convinced. Sound good? Yeah. There we go. That's better. That's better. Okay, so as we break this down, we're going to look at these truths that impact our identity, and we're going to impact three different truths that we go through. The first one is that we are chosen by God. We are chosen by God. See, verse 4 states, He chose us in Him before the creation of the world. And then in verse 5, it says that we were predestined. Now, that statement, that we are chosen by God, has a whole lot of questions, a whole lot of concerns to it. Questions like, well, why does God choose some and not others? What about free will? I mean, do we have free will? And those are great questions. And we're going to get to that and unpack it in a moment. But before we get to those questions, we have to ask these questions. Being, what does the Bible say about this? And what does Paul say about this? And why did he write it? Why did he start his entire letter to the Ephesians with this? 
Why did he write a letter to encourage these people in their faith by saying, you have been chosen and predestined before the foundations of the world? Well, let's start by looking at what the Bible says. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, it tells us that there are secret things, hidden things that have not been revealed to us by God. There are things about him, about his will, and about his work that we just will never know this side of glory. But then there are things that he has revealed to us through his word and through the person of his son, Jesus Christ. Things that we do know. Now, it is our job, believers, it is our job not to wrestle with, to debate, and to argue over the hidden things. But to affirm, to believe, to rest in what has been revealed to us. Okay? We are called to believe and to rest in what, what has been revealed. You see, many have debated this issue, the issue of election, the, 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 the theology, the doctrine of predestination over the centuries. Churches have been split. Families have been broken. Friendships have been lost because of this. You see, the gospel has some sharp edges to it. There's some, there's some sharp things to the gospel that make the gospel hard to swallow. Um, some things that either can seem contradictory in scripture or things that are just outright offensive to us. But that's the reality of the gospel is the, the gospel is beyond our complete and total understanding and it calls us to confront the issues that are present in our lives. So what do I mean by this? What are some of the sharp edges of the gospel? Well, the first one that I can think of, there, there's many and I'm only going to just unpack a few of them. But we see this present in verse three where it says that we serve a triune God. You see, we don't worship three gods. We don't worship a father, son, and spirit. We worship one God who is three distinct persons, one triune God. They aren't parts. It's not like the, the three-leaf clover or whatever. No, no. It's completely, each fully 100% God, yet completely one. So we, we, that, that is hard to think about. Uh, St. Augustine says that the more and more he thought about it, the more he wanted his brain to explode. That's my paraphrase. Um, and I felt the same way. It's a hard thing to swallow. The other thing that's hard to swallow that we affirm in the gospel is that we believe and we preach the hypostatic union. If you've never heard of this, hypostatic union simply means that God became flesh and dwelt among us. That Jesus Christ was both fully God and fully man. And sometimes we rest in the side of his deity. We, we, just, we just sit in that and go, well, yeah, he was God. So it wasn't that hard. No, no, no. He was fully man. And sometimes we can err on the side of his humanity and we go, well, can he really save us? Yes, because he was fully God. So, so we, we, we affirm and we profess the duality that God, Jesus Christ is both fully God and fully man. So another one, another sharp edge of the gospel, one that's really offensive is that, and we're going to read this later as we go through this series, is that we are dead in our sins and trespasses. Uh, Paul writes this in Ephesians that we are dead in our sins and trespasses. Now this isn't, what, what this means is that there is nothing in us, there is nothing about us, there is nothing through us that brings about our own salvation. We can't do it. We are dead. And it's not like Princess Bride where we're like mostly dead. This is, we are totally dead, fully dead, wholly dead. And you might go, well, I'm alive, I'm breathing. What are you talking about right now? That's the complication. We are dead in our sins and trespasses in desperate need of life. And so now we come here and we see another sharp edge of the gospel that you have been chosen, that we have pre been predestined beforehand, before the foundations of the world, God chose his people. And we see this all throughout scripture, actually. In a few passages, I'm just going to read a few of them. One comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. And it says this, For, God, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, and that those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. And then Jesus himself speaks in John chapter 6, verse 44. And he says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. I will raise them up at the last day. So we see that election, that choice, that predestination is present and permeant through Scripture. But here's the other side of it. We also see that the Bible affirms and speaks of our will of our will to, to choose God, to follow him, to long for him. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, it says this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever shall believe in him will not perish, but have eternal life. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some consider slowness. 
Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but that everyone would come to repentance. And then lastly, we see in Revelation 22, verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come and let the one who hears say, come and let the one who is thirsty come and let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life. So we affirm, yes, that we did choose God. If you are sitting here and you're like, I- I- I'm pretty sure that when I gave my life to Christ, I wanted him. Absolutely you did. But before we could ever choose him, he chose us. Before we could ever long for him, he longed for us. Before this earth was even created, he knew us and he loved us. And Paul is writing this not as a, a theological beating stick for people, but as a way of encouragement, as a way to instill boldness, as a way to instill confidence, as a way for us to understand who we are in Christ. You see, before the earth was formed, God loved us. There has never been a time in all of eternity, past, present, or future, where God did not know you, he did not love you. This is pointing back to when God chose his people, the nation of Israel. He chose them to be his chosen people. It's not because they were somehow better than all the other nations. It's not that they were somehow more attractive than all the other nations. It's not that somehow they were more grandiose than all the other nations. In fact, they're constantly referred to as a stiff-necked and stubborn people, continually disobeying God. And yet he chose them. Why? To display his glory. God is, God's choosing of us never violates our will. His choice never goes against our will, but it aligns with it. It brings the two together. See, just as we read in Revelation 22, God created a thirst in us for Christ. That, that we would come to him, that we would long for him, that we would hunger for him. So why is this good news? Why does this impact and shape my identity? What is the truth that should be the core of who I am? Well, because church, if you are in Christ, it's because the Father chose you to be. His choice was not based on you having some good qualities. It had nothing to do with your accomplishments. It had nothing to do with your appearance. It had nothing to do with you. There is nothing intrinsic to you that drew you to him. He chose you. He chose me because he loves us. That's it. And you know why he loves us? Because he loves us. He loves us because he loves us. And you better believe the God who chose us before the foundations of the world is not finished with us. So that you know you can experience this life and that he isn't going to quit on you. You can know that you can experience the hardships of life and know that he isn't going to abandon you. You can know that you can experience the pain of this life and know that he will not forsake you. He chose you. This means that nothing can separate us from God's love. J.D. Greer states it this way. He says, the gospel is this, that God didn't choose us because we were lovely. We were unlovely and scarred by sin. He didn't choose us because we were lovely. We We become lovely because he chose us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so it gives us security that we are chosen in him. But you know what? I think that there's a few stumbling blocks for us. that as we, we, might, we might affirm this, we might believe this, but there's a few things that we trip over in the church. That, that as believers, we, we fall over with this. And the first one is we, we stumble over uh, arrogance and anger. So in arrogance, some of us, uh, we, we take this understanding knowing that uh, I, I, I affirm the, the doctrine of predestination, and so I see myself as superior to others. That my theological camp is superior to all of yours. And now I'm not talking about differences in understanding salvation. I'm talking about differences in interpreting, interpreting these, these aspects of Scripture. Whether some people uh, elevate more the free will, some people elevate more the, the choice of God. I am guilty of this. While I was studying at Moody, it was like, and I was, I was understanding this, and I was like, wow, God chose me. This is amazing. And then I would get puffed up and proud, and I'd be like, wow, I understand this, and other people don't. God must love me more. I must love God more. Man, if only you people could love God like I do. I understand his sovereignty. How ridiculous. How stupid. The only reason I'm loved by God is because he chose to love me. It had nothing to do with my understanding of that. So we can use our vertical realities 
to create in us horizontal arrogance. You know who else did this? The Pharisees. Wow. Pharisee, right here. Don't let what is meant to encourage you create in you a heart of elitism. Don't let the goodness of God's grace create in you an arrogant pride. We have been saved by his grace alone, through faith alone. So the first thing we see is, is arrogance. The other thing we see is anger. Some, some are sitting here, maybe, you're, maybe this is you, you're sitting here and you're going like, I just don't see how God could be loving if he chose beforehand who would be saved. And, and like we said, this is a sharp edge of the gospel to, to swallow. But what we see throughout scripture, remember, we are supposed to affirm the things we, that are revealed to us, not the things that are hidden from us. And we do see that our will is involved in this. But more importantly, we see all throughout scripture that God is himself love. If we ask, how could God be loving? Because he is the definition of what love is. How could God be good? Because he is wholly good. So we know that in scripture that we can believe in this because we believe in a God who is not done with us, who is totally good and who loves us based on his own love. So instead of being arrogant, we should be humble because the only contribution we have to our salvation is our sin. I'm going to say it again. The only, we, we, instead of being arrogant, we should be humbled because the only contribution we make to our salvation is our sin. And instead of being angry, we should be thankful because God is good and loving and he stirs our affections towards him so that our wills align with his. The second stumbling block that I see is one of apathy. And when I say apathy, I mean apathy towards evangelism. I mean, we can go, well, if God chooses, then, you know, my work is done. You got this, God, Go. I'm just going gonna, gonna to go watch football. It's going to be fine. But that's not at all how Paul understood election. We actually see that Paul continually asked the churches that he would write to over and over again that he would boldly proclaim the gospel as he ought to speak. And we saw a fervency for him to go and proclaim the good news to the Gentiles. He wanted to go out and be a missionary. He understood the doctrine of of election, that he was chosen by God, but he also knew that he was chosen for the mission of making God known. That the same God who called us, called us into obedience to tell the world about him. And you you know why Paul has a boldness about him? And the reason that we can also have a boldness about us when we go and preach the gospel? Because salvation does not belong in our hands. That I can talk to someone who is completely hard-hearted, completely resistant to the good news of the gospel. I can share what God has done in my life to someone who completely rejects me. And I know it is not about me. It's just me being an obedient and it's God who is the changing hearts. It is God who is at work. And so I can boldly proclaim because I know that he is, the same God who isn't finished with me isn't finished with them either. And we don't know who's saved. We are called to go. We should, not have, we should not be apathetic towards evangelism. So believer, do you know that you've been chosen by God? Does this shape who you are? Do you see yourself differently because you know that you are loved because you are loved? Or are you trying to constantly prove yourself to God? Are you constantly trying to earn his love? Do you feel like you have sinned too, you've gone too far, you've sinned too much? Do you not know that you are loved because you are loved? The second thing we see is that we are children of God. In verse 5, he says, In love, he predestined us for adoption through sonship in Jesus Christ. Why? In the accordance with his pleasure and will. We have been adopted as legitimate children of God. So what does this mean for us? Well, I'm going to unpack what Paul literally says in this section. And so there's a few things that we affirm that it means that you have been adopted, that you are in the family of faith. If you are in Christ, then you are a son of God. And one of the things that we see is that we are loved. And we just unpack this, that we were chosen by God. So much that it's not just like he says, hey, I love you. Here's some flowers. But he's like, hey, I love you. You're in my family now. You live in my house now. You are my child now. And he did this with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glory and grace. But not only did he love us, adoption means that we are redeemed. That we have been bought back to God. We have been paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. 
and that there is no outstanding debt on our life, we have been freed by grace. And we just sang, who the sun sets free, they're free indeed. Not only are we redeemed, we are forgiven. We are forgiven by God and our sins are no longer counted against us. That we are not only forgiven by God, but clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And then lastly, we see that we are heirs. That we receive the inheritance of God. That in Christ, we are brothers and sisters. And that we are legitimate family members. There's no longer a chasm between us and God. So what does it mean for us? It's a really good question. I'm glad that you guys are asking. This should be completely and totally transforming to us. This should be completely and totally transforming to you and I because I don't have to prove myself anymore. I don't have to prove myself to you. I don't have to prove myself to God. I don't have to prove myself to me. Who cares how well I preach as long as God is glorified? Who cares what I do with my life as long as it's an obedience to the Lord? I could be as successful in your eyes or as a failure in your eyes as long as I am being obedient to the will of my Lord. I don't have to prove myself anymore. I don't have to have the right job, the best grades. I don't have to make a certain amount of money. My identity is not found in what I do, in my education, in my vocation, in my marriage, in my parenting. My identity is found in that I am a child of the King. And that should give me both peace and assurance. But I think there's some lies that we believe that teach us to think that we're orphans. So instead of believing that we are adopted in the family of God, we believe that we are estranged from him. That there's something that we could do. And there's a few things. I think one is, as we just talked about, that instead of not needing to prove ourselves, we feel like we continually need to prove ourselves. We need to prove that we were somehow worth God's death. That somehow we are worthy of God. We need to prove that, that we're good enough. That we're faithful enough. That, that, I mean, look at how many times I've attended church. Like, God's got to be pleased with that. Well, yeah, but no. That isn't what made him love you. Do that because you want to love him. Not because you want him to love you. We don't have to prove ourselves. You know, in life we're told over and over and over again, work harder, earn more, get the good job, be successful. Because if you don't, you won't have security in this life. If you don't, you'll never be satisfied in this life. If you don't, you'll never know what success is in this life. Church, if we are truly adopted by God, then it means that all of our satisfaction, our significance, and our security is wrapped up in being a child of the God who rules the universe. There is nothing we could ever need that God doesn't already supply us. And not only do we have all we need, we have access to him. We talked about this last week. We are now able to talk to him, to pray to him, to go before him because of the work of Jesus Christ. We don't need to prove ourselves. The second thing that we see is that we don't need to be ashamed. And some of us feel like we've just failed God too often. Or maybe for the last time. Like I just can't seem to stop it. And so we're, we're worried that maybe we're going to get kicked out of this family. What, what happens if I lose this grace that God is giving to me? What if he's like, I gave it to you, but not anymore. Uh, I'm taking that one back, Chad. You, you're on your own, man. And we believe this lie that somehow we could lose God's affection, that we could lose his favor. But we're told at the end of this that we have been sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit. We've been sealed in his love. And sometimes I think we can also take our horizontal relationships, the way that we've interacted with each other, and apply them to our understanding vertically. So we can take the love that we've experienced. So some of you, you might be sitting here and you, you go, I've had a really poor home life experience. I have not known what it's like to have a loving parent, whether it's a father or mother or family. Maybe you were in an abusive home or, or a negligent home. Maybe you just had a rough upbringing. Maybe you've had a bunch of estranged friendships, people who've left you, or estranged relationships, people you thought you loved but who turned their back on you. And you go, if this is what love is, I want nothing to do with it. And so we take what we know from broken love, from imperfect love, from conditional love, and we attribute to God whose love is unconditional, who is perfect. And so we attribute the things that we've experienced to God and say, God, this isn't good and you're not either. But we have to know that God is good. His love is perfect and it is completely, truly, and fully unconditional. 
That means that there's nothing you could do to lose his love. There's nothing you could not do to lose his love. That he, again, if, if there's anything you walk away with, please let it be this. God loves you because he loves you. He loves you because he loves you. That's it. You've been sealed. Believer, do you know that? Do you know that you are a child of the king? And that what God has paid the immeasurable price for, he will not forsake. There is no getting kicked out of this family. You're in it for good. The third thing we see is that we are God's church. And as his church, we are called to be unified. In verse 10, it says, to bring to unity all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. And Paul, he's writing to a Gentile church, but there's Jewish believers here as well. So he's writing both to the Jew and to the Gentile. In verse 11 through 14, he's addressing both. And he's, he's addressing both because Jesus has fulfilled what the Old Testament prophets, particularly Isaiah, has prophesied, that the Savior would come bringing salvation for the Jew and the Gentile. This isn't just for Jew, this is for Gentile as well. What that means for us is that all of us can be saved. You don't just have to be born in Israel as a Jew. Everyone, salvation is for all people. And because of that, because we are the bride of Christ, we have a purpose and a mission. The purpose is, our mission is the great commission that we are to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in our triune God in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that we are also supposed to go and teach everything that we have been commanded by God. That is our purpose and mission. Church, we should never be able to say, I just don't know what my purpose is in life. We should never be able to say, I just don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life. Listen to this. Everything, everything in your life comes after the purpose that God has given you. Everything. Everything in our lives comes after after the purpose that God has given us. We are called to be the church and to make him known, to make disciples of all nations. Whether you work in the business world, whether you work in a service industry, whether you serve as a pastor or missionary, we are all to make disciples. We have been given a great purpose and mission. The second thing that we're given is we're called to unity. We're called to be united as the church and the, the, the unity is displayed in both form and in function. And here's what I mean by that. That our unity is displayed in form and function. In form, we are to be distinct and diverse. This is the way we look, our makeup, who we are. And so in distinction, we we have different roles. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and in Romans chapter 12, it tells us of these gifts that we have by the power of the Holy Spirit. Different abilities that we have that are supposed to be used to serve and edify the church. That all of us have been given different qualifications, giftings, and abilities, not for the purpose of our own advantage, but the purpose of serving the bride of Christ. Not everyone is supposed to be preaching. Not everyone is supposed to be leading worship. In fact, you would all hate it if I was leading worship. Y'all would leave and you would be right in doing so because I shouldn't be there. (laughs) Maybe you shouldn't. But you know, we we aren't supposed to, we're supposed to be given and, and lean into the different gifts that God has given us and be distinct in that. And be one unified body. The hand shouldn't say to the eye, I don't need you. Nor should the foot say to the hand, I don't need you. We all need each other. Because we are distinct and unified. The second thing is that we are diverse. That this is a place for all races and cultures. You see, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. Not some nations. Not these nations. All nations. And church, I hate to break it to you in case you didn't realize this, the church didn't start out in America. We are the byproduct of faithful brothers and sisters who were in the Middle East. And it made its way here. We are a product of the faithfulness of our forefathers. All nations. That means we're to celebrate diversity in culture, diversity in language, diversity in ethnicity. We are to be a place where we can come together in a unified purpose. You see, at the end of, of the whole Bible in Revelation chapter 7, it paints, it, the, John, as he's seeing the glories of heaven, paints this picture of what the church looks like. And in, in Revelation 7 verse 9, it says this, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude, one that no one could count, from every nation, every tribe, every people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. 
They were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. And they crowd out in a loud voice. Despite all of the distinctions, despite the, the celebration of diversity, they were all proclaiming the same thing. The thing that unifies us as the church. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Sadly, many churches do not look like this. Church, we don't look like this. We are called to be both distinct and diverse in our form. But not only is our form supposed to be unified, the way we function as the church should be one of unity. We're called to be unified in the way we live, in the way we serve, in the way we love our neighbor. See, in Scripture, it says that we are are called to stand up for the oppressed, to welcome the stranger, to care for the orphan and widow, to love justice and mercy, and to walk humbly before God. As a church, we are united both in who Christ makes us to be and we're called to be imitators of Christ. You see, Christ is the perfect example of this sacrificial service. In Mark 10, 45, it says, But the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom to many. Paul is stating that it's a blessing to be united as the church. It's a blessing to experience the function and form of the church. But there's some things that, there's one thing in particular I think that uh, there's a number of things that keeps the church from doing this, from living into this, from leaning into the reality that you are the bride of Christ, that I am the bride of Christ. And and again, there's many different things, but I just want to focus in on one thing. I just want to focus in on one singular thing, a lie that we believe that keeps us from being united in the body. And that lie is the lie of individualism. We have bought into the Western ideal that the church serves to function me the individual. And we believe in what we call a quote-unquote personal faith. Don't get me wrong, our our faith is is definitely personal, but it's supposed to be lived out corporately. And so we lean into this personal faith instead of living into true community. We come to church and we look for comfort. We just want to hear a, a nice sermon. We want to have a good pastor. We want to have worship that's engaging and fun. Nothing that's too loud and noisy or too boring and, and old school. I want this place to like look nice and, and I, w- I want it to feel like, you know, the way I want it to feel. And, and I want to be around people that I like being around. And, 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 I, and I, want to, I want to make sure that those people aren't there because, you know, I want to be here. And, and we have all these preferences of comfort rather than longing for the conviction that comes from the word of God. Instead of seeking truth that comes from the holy word of scripture, from God himself, or, or from being in community with brothers and sisters who are different from us, We're looking for how the church can serve us. And so the church service feels like a service instead of a corporate gathering of believers proclaiming and professing, worthy is the Lord. Salvation belongs to him. See, this independence, this individualism can create dissension and division and often does in our church. Because instead of dealing with issues that we are called to deal with, like uh, maybe there's, there's church discipline that needs to take place or, or restoration that needs to take place within the church. Instead, churches are splitting over personal preferences and strong personalities. Believer, do you know that you are the bride of Christ? Do you know that you are the church and that together we are united, not in our own ability, but in the ability that God has given us through the Holy Spirit and through the death of the Son? And because we have been chosen by God, we are adopted into his family and we get to be his beloved spouse, his bride, the church. So now that we've seen what the promises of these blessings are, let's look at the person of the blessing. See, I I think we can easily read through this really beautiful, deep theological truth that Paul is stating and we go, wow, that's so good. What am I going to do for lunch? And, And we just miss it entirely. We're like, wow, that was such a good message. You know, Pastor, um, I, just, I probably should go hit up my, my boy and see if he's like free tonight or something. You know, like we, we just, we miss it. And I don't want us to miss it. The only way that we're going to be in awe of these blessings, the only way that we're going to long for these blessings is if we see that we need these blessings. And the only way that we're going to see that we need these blessings is if we see our own condition accurately. See, Paul keeps repeating over and over through this entire section one phrase, in Christ. 
or in him. Over and over. It's actually repeated 11 times in these 12 verses. And the reason is, is that Christ is the person, the object that we receive these blessings. That it is through his life, death, and resurrection that these blessings are made possible for us and to us. And we receive these blessings not because of what we have done or what we are doing, but because of what Christ has finished on our behalf. You see, in our sin, we were far from God. In our sin, we were lost. In our sin, we are dead. We are full of guilt, full of blame, full of shame. In our sin, we're incapable of fixing our mess. We're children living in the destructive orphanage of sin. We're rebellious towards God. In our sin, we are without hope, without peace, without love. This is our state on our own. Helpless. But in Christ, in Christ, we are blessed because he took our curse on his behalf. In Christ, we are chosen because we, he was forsaken by the Father. In Christ, we are holy because he took our sin and clothed us with his righteousness. In Christ, we are blameless because he bore our guilt on the cross. In Christ, we are adopted because he signed our adoption papers in his own blood. In Christ, we are redeemed because he paid our debt. In Christ, we are forgiven because he took on our punishment. We are united because at the cross, the Godhead was divided. We are victorious because Christ rose from the grave, defeating sin and death. And now we have purpose because Christ has accomplished his purpose in his life, death, and resurrection to the praise of his glory. Amen. Church, to the degree that we believe that we have been chosen by God, to that same degree, we will be in awe of the blessings that come from God. To the degree that we understand that we are a child of the king, to that same degree, we will find our satisfaction, our significance, our security in the king. To the degree that we believe that we are the bride of Christ, to the same degree, we will serve that bride and seek the lost. Understanding our true identity should fill us with awe and adoration and thanksgiving. We should be filled with joy. And out of that, understanding our identity should give our life action. We have purpose. Don't let us be gospel amnesiacs. We know who our identity is. We are chosen. We are children. We are the church. To the glory of God. Let's pray. Lord God, we praise you. We praise you that in your sovereignty, in your grace, in your mercy, for whatever reason that brought you glory, you chose to love us and to make us your children. And you give us purpose as your church. And Lord, you, you even ask us, you long for us, you want us to be unified as you, our triune God is unified. Lord, that we get to reflect you in every capacity, every facet, every moment of our lives. Lord, I pray, I pray that as we wrestle through life, as we struggle with our own pain, with the sins either that we've done or the sins that have been done to us, Lord, that we would never forget who we are because we know whose we are. Lord, this is our true identity. Let us never forget it. And Lord, let us live in it. Pray this in your name. Amen.